Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. It's wonderful to be here with all of you. My name is Zaya Tong. I am a science broadcaster and also very proudly on the board of directors of We Animals Media, the publisher of this powerful and epic book that we are celebrating the launch of tonight. It's called Hidden, and it is edited by Joanne MacArthur and Keith Wilson. Both Joanne and Keith are going to be joining us shortly in conversation, and we have a very special guest who's going to be performing for us later as well, legendary singer, songwriter, and animal rights activist Jan Arden. So make sure to stay tuned for that a little bit later this evening. After the discussion as well, we're going to have a chance to have an audience Q&A with all of you. So I'll be opening up the discussion. Please feel free to leave your questions in the comments section, and I'm going to try to get to as many of those questions as I can. So whenever you have a question come to mind, feel free, feel free to type that in. And tonight we also have a very special giveaway prize, we're going to be offering the chance to win a signed copy of Hidden. All you have to do is actually leave us uh, an idea, a comment in the chat with what you would do with the book and how you would like to see it go out into the world and reach as many people as possible. And uh, we're going to be announcing the winner on our Facebook page in 24 hours. But first tonight, before we start things off, I really want to kick things off with a non-traditional Indigenous welcome by Mandy Howard. Mandy is a Mi'kmaq from First Nations from New Brunswick, and she's a land and water protector as well as an animal advocate. Everybody, please welcome Mandy. Ane bojo gwe. I'm Mandy, and uh, welcome. Today I am sitting with you um, in Toronto, Toronto um, the dish with one spoon. Um, I would like to do a, a gentle, non-traditional land acknowledgement today with everyone across, across the globe, whoever is out there listening. It's a, a gentle call to action. We all walk on this land and Mother Earth is our closest and oldest ancestor as long as well as the waters that she carries. Um, I want everyone to take moments of their lives to, to really find out about the land that they live on, where their guests from, where their ancestors have come from and how um, in their daily lives, they're responsible for that land now and how they can um, think about how to um, protect the land at, while they're protecting animals. Uh, the creator in all of our creation stories um, gave us to the animals. They did not give the animals to us. Um, Non-human animal kin are our first protectors and our first family. Um, so I would love for everyone to take moments that are hard and listen to the truths of colonization, even, even if it's really hard to handle, especially when you're listening to truths that completely go against everything that you have been told your entire lives about where you come from, where the land that you live on comes from and who quote unquote owns land because colonization doesn't just affect people, it affects the animals who are our first kin and they need us. I just wanna thank everyone for being brave enough to challenge colonization and stand up for animals, for the land, for the waters, for the people, and know that you know you stand with us in solidarity. Willowlin, Free Palestine. Thank you so much, Mandy, for that badass Indigenous welcome. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you mentioned, Palestine, I just want to actually mention that We Animals Media is actually currently developing a documentary project called Nations of Their Own. And it will be looking at 
human rights and animal rights in the Palestinian territory. So um, right before we introduce uh, our main act, who is, uh, you know, basically we're going to have Joanne and Keith who are really going to join us and share a lot of their heart and passion that went into this book. I do want to share a video with all of you first. Um, this is really to give you a glimpse of what the book is about and what some of the images are about. So let's take a look. So as you can all see, the images that we were just looking at right now and that we'll be sharing with you tonight are incredibly haunting, but they are a testament to what we've really kept hidden in society for such a long period of time. And as Joanne has said, action is catharsis. And really the first step to creating change is daring to look, daring to have empathy and daring to open our eyes. So really, my first thanks really go out to all of you in the audience for having the courage to see. And now uh, I really want to invite onto our stage the two co-editors of this book, uh, wonderful earthlings, brilliant and powerful photographers and photo editors, starting with uh, my fellow Earthling, Joanne MacArthur. She is the hidden creator and co-editor. She is an award-winning photojournalist who's been documenting the hidden lives of animals for almost two decades now. In that time, she's traveled to over 60 countries to photograph people's complex and often really disturbing treatment of animals for her nonprofit organization, We Animals Media. And just a reminder that photographs inside of We Animals Media Archive are actually freely available to anybody to use who is advocating for animals. Uh, Joanne is also the recipient of many awards for her photography, including the 2017 Wildlife Photographer of the Year People's Choice Award. This is her third book. Everybody, please welcome Joanne MacArthur. Hooray! Yeah. <laughs> Zaya, thanks for such a great welcome. And I got, yeah. of course, another great person to welcome, another fellow Earthling, um, writer and journalist Keith Wilson, who is staying up very late at night from the United Kingdom, joining us all the way from there. And uh, we are really fortunate uh, that Keith became the co-editor of Hidden because he's a highly sought after editor of fine art and photography books. Uh, Keith's books include Zero Footprint, as long as there are animals, silver, and the bestsellers, remembering elephants and remembering rhinos for the Born Free Foundation. Uh, Keith is also the co-founder of Photographers Against Wildlife Crime, and in 2013, he launched Wild Planet, the world's first digital magazine devoted entirely to wildlife and conservation photography. Keith and Joe, in the words of millennials, I stan you. <laughs> <laughs> Great My goodness. <laughs> it's, a I great think I've, it's the first time I've ever been bowed to. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Not the last one, sorry. Now, a big, big welcome to you both. And um, I really want to flip the script as we start discussing this book. Typically, when we talk at a book launch, we start at the beginning. 
I want to do the reverse. I want to start at the end because there's a really profound quote at the back of this book. It's by Nick Brandt. I'm just going to read a short excerpt for it uh, for our audience at home. It says, I am quite simply in awe of these photographers. In a way, they are like war photographers, except witness to a war that so many people have little idea exists or choose to suppress exists. So, Joe, starting with you, perhaps you could tell us, you know, how is being an animal photojournalist like being a war photographer? This is a terrible time for me to be emotional. You know, I, I love that you started with the Nick Brandt quote about our work, because when we were watching that video, I was feeling really mama bear about all of these conflict photographers who are animal photojournalists out there risking themselves and their sanity to to do this important work, which is finally getting, getting traction in the media and in the world and in uh, conversations globally. And so what I see we animals doing is uh, we're one part of that conversation. We are animal photojournalists out in the world telling the stories uh, that no one wants to see that must be seen and being strategic about uh, about getting them out there, which is why we founded a photo agency and, and which is why we've created a book of animal photojournalism, which is a book of what is and should never again be. Yeah, indeed. And I know, you know, because, you know, you and I have gone to see films about war photographers. James Nakwe was a big influence of yours as well, right? Absolutely. He uh, he was the inspiration for this book. When I saw his book, Inferno, which is a, a book of similar size, uh, showing famines and refugees and civil war and genocides, uh, I thought that animals deserved such a book. And uh, not so much the animals we are used to seeing and not the wildlife photography we are used to seeing, but the animals that we consume by the billions every single day. Um, we are we're eating the world to death with the number of animals that we're um, confining and killing every single moment of every day. And they just have uh, no voice or rather they have a voice, just not one that we're listening to. And so uh, just as the conflict photographers are, um, you know, bringing attention to these individuals caught in in war. And it's a it's a controversial thing, probably to talk about what we do as, as war photography, but I do see it that way. It is conflict photography. We are documenting a conflict against um, a number of species, uh, against others, against invisibles. And uh, these are things that we, we say when we're talking about war photography as well. Maybe Keith wants to add to that hmm. or not. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, um, when we got first got together to, you know, formulate the idea for this book. I mean, Joe was very clear right from the beginning, you know, what she just said about the inspiration being Natwe and in Inferno and that this is a book about the war on animals, which frankly has not been reported before. This is what I think makes Hidden so groundbreaking because it is the first time you've got such an anthology of work and stories together. And um, it's, it, it's incredibly educational, even though it is visually shocking but you know we weren't um going to pull any punches that was very clear as well so um you know for me as a as an editor and writer you know i i had a very clear message and understanding right in the beginning when joe and i first got together to to work on this well for me you know when i first looked at the book i knew pretty much immediately that this was going to be a history book I've been saying all week on Twitter that this is also a life-changing book. So when you're working on something which is fundamentally, I think people in the 22nd century are going to look back in this, obviously in horror, but also this is a document. It is proof. It is evidence. So Keith, as an editor, how did you decide to structure this book? Uh, how did you pick the themes? They sort of picked themselves. Um, I remember it was the last time I saw Jo actually before the pandemic, um, because she was over here in London in in January of last year, and uh, we were you know because we spent you know a whole week you know, doing the initial edit, and um, and she um, wrote down on little bits of paper, and then put them down on the floor of her Airbnb, and uh, which was pretty much the order of 
of, of the content of the book. And looking at it from above, it looked like um, sort of a, a paper fossil of the vertebrae of a dinosaur with various limbs and ribs coming out at, at the side. And, you know, I dutifully, you know, well, we both photographed it and I dutifully wrote it down as well. And then that sort of was the structure. Of course, it, you know, it changed as we, as, you know, as it evolved, as the pictures were being um, selected. But it's, it's quite simply, you know, it's a story with a beginning and an ending, which are pretty obvious and the, the, and really just shows visually all the various ways in which we use animals, not just for, you know, con uh, our food, um, but also for things like entertainment or for clothing or, you know, culture and tradition. Um, so there's some very nebulous uh, reasons given for the way in which we kill and consume animals. If I can add here that at this point, I needed to hand the massive edit that we had made to Keith and take my hands off of it. He and I agreed to this. I'm yeah. really close to the subject matter and very attached to many of those images. We could have crammed this book with a thousand images, mm. you know, maybe two, three, four, five, six per per page or for a double page spread, but we wanted to give a lot of space to the best images. And so I needed to hand it off to Keith and trust him fully to take it from our edit of what was like a thousand images down to the edit, which is Keith, what, 208 images? Uh, 204, I think, actually, to be precise. That's, inclu <laughs> that's including the covers. But I mean, to begin I couldn't with, have done we, it. We, to begin with, Joe, we had, we must have looked at, I, lo I lost count after about 4,000 images that we were looking at. Well, so, we might have looked. We might have looked at four thousand of my images, <laughs> like not even, you know, the actually, major yeah, contributions yeah. by yeah. by some yeah. of the most prolific photographers out there. Ator Garmendia, Andrew Scaron. We had a mm. huge amount of images from the group Animal Equality, who have yep. done investigations yeah. in at least a dozen countries. Uh, so it was, it was epic. We have, we have about forty uh, award-winning photographers who contributed to this book, from what I understand, and. Joe, I'm wondering if you can talk to us a little bit about the risks that these photographers actually take, because in many countries, uh, in many provinces, including Ontario, there are now these ag, -AG laws, which perhaps you could explain to people what an ag, -AG law is. Um, and really, you know, how risky is this for people? I mean, that sometimes there's jail time involved for people who are going out there and, and taking these photographs to show us what's happening. You can even be charged under the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act in the USA. So you can be charged federally as a terrorist for taking images on properties or even from public property uh, of an animal industry. And so there's a lot of lobbying, a lot of money behind this in order to uh, protect what needs to be seen, to protect industry, to, in, to protect profit. And um, we're seeing these uh, globally right now. We are going to see them overturned. It's just a waste of resources. It's really unfortunate. Um, we're seeing them come and go in the US, for example. And now we have them in four provinces here. Manitoba is the latest to announce ag gag. And, um, you know, they say it's to protect the animals and it's uh, about biohazards and, and all this, but it protects industry and it keeps, um, keeps these animals hidden. Uh, I think that, well, Keith and I think, and animal photojournalists think that if uh, people were to see these images, they would be unhappy about it. They'd be unhappy about supporting what's in these images. We still, to this day and age, see images on ads for animal use of cows in fields. Uh, I, I particularly loathe these ads that say, uh, who made your eggs today? And it's a picture of a farmer in front of a red barn, like a windowless red barn. Yeah. Who made your eggs today? Well, your the farmer didn't, that's for sure. Someone else did. So let's see, uh, let's see the truth. And that's what animal photojournalists do. We are showing a different side to the story. And I would say we're showing a more realistic side to the story. Um, and animal, animal rights is a really cool place to be these days because there's so many ways that we're tackling this. Um, I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. I mean, we animal photojournalists contribute in this way, but there's animal law, which is a growing field. There's neuroscience. There's, I mean, all sorts of sciences, all sorts of arts and creative ways that we are using now to expose 
animal cruelty and change animal cruelty. So I want to move now into some of the images of the book that we're going to be showing uh, our, our folks at home. But before we do that, I want to share a couple of images that are not in the book. Uh, because we're bombarded and we're actually really quite saturated with images that really hide uh, the, the real, well, the real lives that go into a lot of end products, whether it is food, whether it is fashion, whether, you know, whether it's any other sort of household good as well. We, we tend to forget through the process of rendering how many animals turn into glue and paintbrushes and all these sorts of invisible things. But let's take a look at a couple quick images right now. Um, if we could see the first one, what you're looking at here is gorgeous photography, high level cuisine. This is foie gras. The next image is fur. If we could take a look at this next image here. You'll see, again, something that is really deemed quite aspirational. Uh, we're just taking a little look here, here. And, you know, even though, for example, fur coats went out of fashion, what came back into fashion and became cool again was fur trim. And I just think it's incredibly um, damaging because most of the images we see are things that we really aspire to. They're luxury images. So, Keith, can you walk us through the hidden side of these images? What are we not seeing when we look at photographs like this? And let's start with one image by yeah. Luis Tato that we have right here from the book. Yeah, yeah. Well, this is the reality of uh, foie gras, that luxury food item that uh, you get in uh, many restaurants. And this, um, yeah, th this poor creature, well, it its beak has been broken by the forced feeding uh, that it has to endure in order to artificially uh, expand the size of its liver to, you know, about seven, eight times its natural size before it is then slaughtered, um, just so people can consume the liver. And um, it's, a, you know, it's a pretty barbaric practice. And we have, a you know, some other photos in the book of this, of, of um, ducks and geese actually being force fed. But the thing about um, and it's a very, you know, foie gras is something that's still very popular, you know, in, in Europe, even though countries like the UK, you know, you don't have foie gras farms, they're outlawed, but the loophole is you can still import the product from countries like uh, France and Spain, where, uh, which are the main producers. And right now there is a, an act of parliament being drafted to actually ban the sale and consumption of foie gras, the product itself. So if that happens, then, the, you know, maybe that will have an even bigger impact to, to stop this. But it's, you know, these are how the, the birds are kept. You know, they're just crammed in these cages. They're, they're brutalized. They're just treated as a commodity. Absolutely. And the, the hidden reality is, is just truly brutal compared to what we see in the magazines. Let's take a look at this next photograph. Um, this is a photo actually taken by Joe. Uh, Keith or Joe, if you want to speak to what's actually happening here in this image. Will you let me, Joe? Please, please. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, this is the thing. This is um, these are raccoon dogs. And actually, it's a family of raccoon dogs. You know, it's a mother and a, a couple of pups. And um, yeah, again, they're just in a wire cage here, uh, barely big enough to, to contain them. And uh, they're just kept there, uh, grown until they're slaughtered, obviously, for fur, for something like a fur trim collar or a fur coat. But what a lot of people don't appreciate about fur is that it, it takes, for something like a mink or a fox or raccoon dog, and these are the three uh, most, dare I say it, popular um, animals that are, that are raised for fur, uh, it takes about 40 animals to make one fur coat, right? 40 animals. So if this is a family, how many families, more families, I don't know, dubious uh, fashion statement. Um, I find it sort of bizarre that, you know, fur keeps coming in and out of fashion. And um, most, uh, and Europe is a huge producer of fur still. And let's not forget the dangers of, uh, of fur that have, come up from the, the COVID crisis, particularly in Denmark, which uh, with mink, you know, there are about 17 million mink were, were killed um, a few, just a few months ago because COVID-19 appeared in the mink and it mutated and it cross-infected back into the people keeping the mink. 
this is the dan the other danger as well as the obvious hum uh, animal cruelty that this sort of um, industry is is threatening upon all of us and it's just got to be stopped I've just never heard like anybody put it that way or say that it's it's families. Mm. Joe, you took this photo. Um, you know, I've also heard that raccoon dog fur is sometimes sold as faux fur when, of course, it isn't faux at all. Yeah, and uh, that's not on the label. So how are we to know? I do want to say something about this image and the last one, uh, the foie gras image. These are animals who are looking directly into the camera. And this is the experience we have as animal photojournalists uh, going into these places. The animals are always looking at us, uh, the perpetrators, uh, the cause of their, of their suffering. And it is quite haunting to see them looking at us. They always have the questions and we always have the answers, not us, you know, the, the journalists, but uh, people in general, we're controlling everything. They have absolutely no autonomy. And so something that we see, you know, whether it's a, a duck or a mink or a cow or a calf, uh, they're always looking at us mm. saying with their eyes very clearly, what's next? What are you doing yeah. to me? Um, we take their children, you know, we, we stamp them with tattoos and we cut their ears and we do all these things to them. So this is a commonality. This is something you'll see throughout the book. You'll see scale. We wanted to show scale, the number of animals in a farm, for example, but we also really want to show the individuals and allow the audience to connect with them. And the eye contact is one of the, the main ways we do that, the main ways they do that with us. Yes. I, mean, I, I was definitely struck by that. There are many images when you look in the book that, um, you know, whether there's the horse image that we'll perhaps show a little bit later where they are looking directly at you, each animal, each individual, uh, each personality. One thing that, um, you know, I think that you know, I work uh, with the World Wildlife Fund. I'm also on that board there. And I think that we often hear about charismatic megafauna. We know that people love panda bears. They love tigers. They love the fuzzy fuzzies, right? Um, so I want to look at another image here. Um, and it's a fish. And it's because, you know, this is one thing that you write about, Joe, in the book, this idea that fish don't count. Quite often we hear people say they're vegetarians, but they eat fish. Somehow fish are not animals to a lot of people. And yet when people watch films like The Octopus Teacher, right, all of a sudden they realize, oh, my God, I can fall in love with a marine animal. And there's one quote in there that I found really powerful, uh, Joe, where you say, we measure their deaths not as individuals, but by the ton. And when I first saw this photo in The Guardian, I was shocked by it, even though I've seen, uh, I've seen this photo, I've seen this in real life a million times growing up in Asia. So what's going on here? Hmm. Well, you're right, we don't, we don't count them. It's impossible to count them. So we measure them roughly by the ton and that often doesn't even include the, uh, what we call bycatch, yeah. uh, the dolphins and the turtles and all the other animals um, that are caught and thrown back in, they die, um, but they're, they're not profitable. So what you're seeing here is fish tethering. Um, this is a way of keeping fish alive and fresh longer. It's a practice we see in Asia and in South America. Um, I found it just so <laughs> insidious, I guess, that the string that is used is the exact color of blood. It seems to me that they do that, uh, we do that, so that the blood is less noticeable. And uh, fish can stay, uh, tied like this for up to 12 hours, they can stay alive for that long. And so what happens is that the fish is curled and crushed when you, when you hear it, when you're up close photographing and you're there, you hear the bones in the fish breaking, the mouth is tied around the tail tightly. So they are tail to mouth and, um, and they're sold like this. I guess if they are layered, um, they would suffocate faster. It's unbelievable. Mm. That is obviously horrifying because it's it's needless suffering. Um, Joe and Keith, though, I, I do have a question to ask. I have to put my journalist hat on, um, which mm -hmm. is really looking at 
you know, despite, you know, despite the fact that all of us here would love for animals to not have to suffer at all, especially for food or otherwise, given, given the abilities that we have for plant-based nourishment here in places like North America. But in places uh, in the global south, where we know that billions of people rely on fish for food, I know that recently there was a big backlash to the film Sea Spiracy, and it wasn't, it was, it was conservation scientists who had that backlash because they were saying, listen, um, billions of people in coastal regions, this is their daily food. So as animal rights activists, what are your thoughts on, on that issue? How do you contend with the complexity of an issue like that? Well, it's something that we need to talk about, but I think what Keith and I are doing here is really zoning in, zooming in on industrial farming and the growth of industrial farming. Um, we're not saying that uh, people shouldn't eat, and we know that it's going to take a lot of time and a lot of transitioning to get the world over to eating a lot more plant-based. But in the meantime, we need to see the, the results of our actions and the, the consequences of our actions. And part of that is mass suffering of billions of individuals daily. And so we're putting that conversation forth. We're putting those images forth so that we can wrap that into the complex issues of what do we do? How do we feel, feed this many people? How do we transition? How do we curb animal use? Because we absolutely must curb animal use. There are a lot of ways of doing it. Uh, it's just one part of the conversation. Uh, absolutely. Keith? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, you know, it's about how do we use, um, our land by the land i mean the the whole planet you know not just the land but the oceans as well and um you know we're, we're, at, at the way we we use our land is not very efficient uh in terms mm -hmm. of um feeding ourselves you know um I mean, especially when it comes to to meat um you know so much it, it's a very the current system for um you know raising cows and pigs and sheep you know for to be consumed as meat is in, an incredibly inefficient use of land if your objective is to feed the pe everyone on this planet so that no one is starving and um you know and the whole the whole idea of um of factory farming has it's only it, it, it's really taken off just in um you know in the last generation or two and um it's sort of like it's almost got to the point where it's it, it's becoming supply led rather than there being a demand for people more people wanting to eat meat it's because meats become cheaper and more available and that's as a result of factory farming and we're seeing the same thing happen now with fish with aquaculture you know 20 odd years ago fish a fish farm there weren't that many fish farms around it's 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 a really boom um side of, of the whole food industry and and this is um how it it's growing is because supply is creating the demand rather than the demand causing supply to to evolve and to, and to grow so you mentioned uh the the animals being the middleman it's true yeah yeah um all of that agricultural uh, growth of plants could be fed directly to people instead of using totally. it to, to feed and fatten a cow. Yeah. Um, I mean, that just uses a lot more resources and it's a lot more polluting to do it that way. So, and maybe we could take a, an image actually from the book and, and you could speak to yes. that because we have an image right here and it is of the Amazon. Yeah. I mean, this demonstrates it's just d demonstrates the the paradox perfectly it really does um you know this is in the amazon base and you can see that it's, it's a blaze and in the foreground there are cows so this is a ranch a ranch i should say pardon my accent um and uh, but still there's not enough land still they have to feel they've got to burn down more of the rainforest in order to open up more land for cattle which are basically and the cattle um are primarily being fed soya so most of the soya that's that's mm -hmm. grown in brazil goes to feed the cattle and yet the rainforest is being cleared 
for to grow the soy as well as to give space for, for the for the cows and at the and an area and this is a frightening statistic but you know uh, there's 200 million head of cattle to use the farming term uh, in the Amazon basin mm. on an area of land the size of Germany and Austria combined and that's growing and that land used to be virgin primary tropical rainforest that's gone it's not going to come back so you in burning the the, the forest you're adding to the co2 emissions as well as shrinking the rainforest which is supposed to which is our best protection for absorbing co2 as well as using this using the land in an incredibly inefficient way in which to feed people and most of the most of the um the the, the meat, the beef coming out of Brazil is actually going to McDonald's. They, McDonald's are the biggest customer for Brazilian beef. That is just horrifying. Absolutely. You know, that uh, that's something that's definitely hidden that we don't see at all. Um, mm. I want to move now a little bit away from the images and talk really on the flip side of the images, uh, being the person who's taking the photos being on the other end of the lens. So Joe, I mean, I mean, we saw just even at the very beginning of, of when I introduced you and your eyes were watering and I know that this is moving for you. So what is the psychological impact for you of doing this work? And what kind of support is there for people who are animal photojournalists doing this work? How do you kind of get through this? Because you're looking directly into their eyes, you're looking directly into real devastation like we were seeing just now. Yeah, uh, as I often say, the hardest part is leaving and uh, leaving with our images tucked safely into our camera. Uh, our biggest hope is there. And uh, it definitely, I can say, I can speak for a lot of us when I say that it breaks our hearts to have to leave uh, so much, so many animals behind who are suffering. And what kind of structure is there for help for us? Well, this is a really new field and there are very few of us and we talk amongst ourselves about how to cope. Uh, there are, you know, books and therapists and uh, time and each other and community and catharsis and action, as I always say. Um, but it is hard and a lot of us uh, do suffer from uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, which is something that a lot of war photographers suffer from as well. Uh, we come back from the field, so to speak, and we're not the same. Uh, it's hard to leave those individuals behind. Yeah, it took me a lot of time to to get used to the work, um, but I don't numb myself to it and I don't turn myself off when I'm in these places. In fact, I'm as open and as emotional as I possibly can be. And I don't mean crying and sobbing because of their suffering. I mean, just being very open and receptive to uh, what they seem to be feeling so that I can, I can capture that and I can feel that as well. Um, feeling what they feel as much as I can motivates me to, to continue this work. So I don't shut down my emotions, but what I have developed over time is a, um, a healthy way of compartmentalizing. I don't just stuff it all down. I, you know, I know that suffering exists everywhere, every second of every day, but I don't have to live in that suffering. I would have a very unhappy life if I did that. And so I choose to uh, focus on joy and change and doing what I can to make the world a better place, uh, knowing that they are suffering and knowing that I will go back as much as I can to document what they're going through so that others can see. And it's true, you know, knowing knowing Joe, she is such a smiley and joyful person, despite the horrors that she witnesses uh, very frequently. And Keith, you know, that's a then that leads into the question that I have for you. I was thinking about this today. I was thinking about how, as human beings, we always have this image of the Grim Reaper that we fear. And I was thinking, really, on this planet, we are the Grim Reapers. We are the ones who decide for most most of Earth's inhabitants when they are born and where they live and how they die. We decide that for 70 billion terrestrial animals, not even including the marine animals. And, you know, obviously what we're, what what is in the book sometimes is like right out of a horror movie. 
because the forms of death, despite the, the euphemism of humane uh -huh. death that we tend to use, common methods include hanging, gassing, stabbing, anal electrocution, skinning alive, being shot, and bludgeoned to death. These are all horrifying ways to die. So there's so many animal lovers out there. The internet is filled with cuddly animals, but people recoil from images of horror because they don't like to see cruelty to animals. So for you, Keith, then how do you, how do you hope people will receive hidden? How do you get a book like this into the hands of people who don't want to open their eyes? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, Cause I've struck that already and you know amongst friends you know who heard about the book and i said well you know i've i've you know sort of I've said to them well i'm not sure if you really want to see it um because it's not the sort of book that they're used to but then i sort of think but you know what this is not a book that um anyone the like of which anyone would have seen before certainly not to do with animals and um but you know if they're asking me for it then i say well look take a look because you know by looking at this book you are in effect bearing witness which is what you know photographers like joanne uh, are doing all the time in this field and it is important to to bear witness um because it's only by confronting uh the raw facts the reality of the issues and and certainly the hideous ways in which we we treat and kill animals uh, it's only by confronting those facts that you can possibly uh, then consider, well, the, the, the questions that follow, that is this right? Should it continue? What else could we be doing, etc.? And that's, that's the whole point of um, the, you know, uh, of the book. It isn't just to shock, it is to inform because, um, you know, it's not like any of these things are being recreated or are being photoshopped or are a distortion of the facts. Um, far from it. Um, Joe earlier mentioned about a couple of the photographs about the eye contact to camera, and that's certainly as someone new, you know, coming into this um, as an editor. That's certainly one of the main things that got me about the pictures as well was the the emotion that was coming through the eyes of these animals. It was. Um, you know, particularly pigs, but frankly, all of them, um, you know, you, you could read their feelings and uh, you just sort of immediately think, well, if this was a, a, a child or a fellow human or a member of my family, you know, I would not, of course, I would not allow this to happen. And so, you know, I think people need to, you know, check into these emotions as well and realise that, we are ultimately just another animal on this planet. You know, we're a primate, aren't we? You know, gorillas, chimpanzees, they're our cousins. And yet some of the things we do to them is is horrific. So, you know, I sort of, I, I would like to like to have begun uh, this, this presentation today by saying to everyone, hello, uh, my fellow animals. And we, we've got to really reconnect um, to not just to nature, but to every other creature that, uh, whether it be a wild animal or a farmed animal, that uh, that occupies a space on this planet. Uh, you know, they, they deserve to be here just as much as we do. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, now, we have just a little bit of time before uh, I'm going to invite Jan to join us for a song and a performance. Um, but I do want to just sort of end with one final question. You know, you just mentioned that we are animals. We are homo sapiens. We've actually named ourselves the wise man, <laughs> which sometimes we're filled with a little bit more folly than wisdom. But at the same time, we are entering an age of tremendous change. Uh, we're seeing this big movement now towards plant-based foods, towards cellular agriculture, a growing awareness of the harms of fur, of animal testing. The UK recently recognized animals as sentient beings. So I'm wondering for each one of you, what gives you hope? And for the people who are listening today, what is one thing that you would like them to do? So Keith, let's start with you. What would I like? Oh, um, I think it's important to see how, how you can change perhaps just some of your own behavior attitudes just to think you know if we can get people 
um, from looking at this book just to reconsider their their own lives or their own choices yeah then that's a big step um you know i don't i mean i made a personal decision when i began editing this the, the, this book and that was i said well it would be crazy for me as the uh, you know as a co-editor of the book the principal writer of the book um to be tucking into a steak or a hamburger um so i gave up meat completely um and uh before starting this book that was the decision and i haven't gone back just because the <laughs> it wasn't the case. Oh, the book's printed now. I can go back and uh, and eat uh, eat meat. I haven't. You know, I couldn't possibly do that. So I am now, you know, absolutely um, wedded to a plant based diet and loving it. I uh, don't have any regrets at all about that or any hankerings. So simple, you know, and that's that's probably the most profound choice or change that people can make is to is to their diet, and we're seeing a huge movement now happen it's not it's not a fad i go into the supermarket and i just see more and more shelf space being given to plant-based foods and uh, it's fantastic it's a huge growth industry and people are absolutely sticking with it so and the, yeah and to see you, you you mentioned about um you know what's happening in the uk about recognizing animals as sentient beings you know it's, it's interesting to see more and more uh policy starting to become headline with our with our governments with our political parties and that gives me a lot of optimism for the hope i mean this is definitely the decade we have to make some really profound changes in all of these areas if we're to see the rest of the century out as as a species on earth thank you so much for that really thoughtful answer joe how about you uh, what gives you hope in this age between the gap of where we've been and where we're going? And also, what is the one thing that you hope people will, will take away from this? Well, to echo Keith, uh, we can stop eating animals. <laughs> there's, yeah. there's, lot, there's lots to eat. Uh, we can do that. Uh, do it as quickly as you can. And I know that's not easy for uh, some people. It depends on the country you're in and your culture and uh, your economic situation, but uh, it is something that we can all strive to to do. And um, what I'd like to ask of people is, you know, from, this is coming from an animal photojournalist and someone who has been bearing witness for almost 20 years to, to suffering, is to to look at your relationship to suffering. And part of why all of these cruelties continue to be perpetuated is because we don't wanna look because we are afraid of our suffering and we're afraid of the suffering of others. But uh, suffering is a reaction and a feeling that we can do something with, it's actionable. If you are suffering from seeing suffering uh, or if there's you know suffering that you wanna do something about, I mean, that is, that is a cue to, to change something. It's a cue to look and to consider and to think critically. So that's what we do as photojournalists is, is we're asking people to look. It might make you suffer because what we're showing you is absolutely terrible, but what can you do with that? And suffering can be turned into something very, very productive. And that's exactly what we do at We Animals Media. Now, what gives me hope is the number of ways, as I mentioned earlier, the number of ways that people are participating in creating a kinder world for all. And so I have a lot of hope in cultivated meat and plant-based initiatives and food tech. I have a lot of hope in animal law and policy and policy changes, so much growth there. Uh, we're seeing a lot of change in this direction generally and globally, mind you, we are seeing also in some places the growth of meat eating still, unfortunately, but we're also seeing a major rise in uh, eating fewer animals. It seems like that, those two things can't be uh, parallel, but they are running parallel and, uh, and we're seeing both. So, you know, I'm just going to keep encouraging people to make small and big changes, whatever they can do. I'm going to champion the heck out of anyone who is seeing and not turning away and making kind choices for others. I think that's it. Well said. And I know, um, Joe, you actually had something that you wanted to share with us 
uh, as we close off this portion, you wanted to share with us um, a prayer. Is that right? It is a prayer. It's a prayer by Shanti Deva. He was a philosopher and a Buddhist monk in the eighth eighth century. And this uh, is from his book, The Way of the Bodhisattva. And as a student of Buddhist philosophy, this really rings beautifully to me. But also, this is a prayer that, for me, um, is not just about the non-human animals in the book. It's about everyone in the book. And in fact, it's about all animals and all humanity. And this prayer reads... By the way, um, this image is a cross from a very harsh image of a man clubbing a pig. So we see it there, uh, an extremely violent image, but this prayer goes out to, you know, everyone working in that slaughterhouse, the animals who are being killed and uh, everyone, everyone. <laughs> here, here is the prayer. May the frightened cease to be afraid and those bound be freed. May the powerless find power and may people think of benefiting each other. For as long as space remains, for as long as sentient beings remain, until, they, until then may I too remain to dispel the miseries of the world. And it is so powerful. Thank you so very much, Joe, for sharing that in peace. Thanks. And um, we will be returning again with you both very shortly. But for right now, um, we're very fortunate. We're really fortunate to have another guest join us tonight. Uh, a magnificent earthling, somebody I'm very proud to call a friend. Some of you may know Jan for her iconic singing career. Some of you will know her from her books and TV shows on CTV and on Hulu. Some of you will know her from her incredible work that she's doing to, to stop the export of horses with her horseshit campaign. Everybody, please a warm welcome to Jan Arden. Hi. Boy, this has been um, extremely, uh, it's been difficult, I think, to wade through a lot of these images. I have the book hidden. I was very fortunate that uh, Joanne had reached out to me, and, and I am the proud owner of a book that I have had not a lot of people in my home, but there's four or five people that I see, and it is in a place where people open it up and look at it. And I'm always, I sit back and I, or Keith, and I just, I sit back and I wait for the comments. And there's a, a fair amount of silence. They flip back to the cover. And what is this book? Well, it's about bearing witness to how our fellow earthlings, how you so aptly put so many, you know, I love that Zaya about a fellow earthling. Your Twitter feed is magnificent because it unites us. But anyway, the, the comments and the, the size and the, the heaviness and, um, but it's, it's met with so much compassion and met with open arms with, I need to do more. I can do more. How do I stop this? Can you believe what happens in the world? And I quietly say, well, you're part of it. And we cannot remove ourselves from that. And I think that disconnect, these are good people. These are good hearted people. Yeah, they ate a burger and they have tuna salad sandwiches out of the can. But I say it with, with love and respect. God, you know, can you believe that people in the world do this? And I just say we're, we're part of the chain. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, for me, the biggest wake-up call that I had was, you know, I didn't, I'm, I've been vegan for five years now, but it took me, you know, 54 years of, you know, stopping red meat and then thinking that, you know, fish and chicken and turkey. Turkey was like my last holdout. I don't know why. <laughs> so... I do have uh, a lot of kindness for people that are going on the journey to find their way through. And I think once you know, uh, it, it becomes much easier. And then not only does your eating change, um, then your advo advocacy kicks in. And so uh, that was just an addition to 
okay, I've done this now. I'm eating plants. I'm a completely different human being. I feel different. I act differently. I feel prouder of my place in the world. I feel like I'm able to go out and do my work with pride and with commitment that I am not part of this problem as far as what I eat. But then I thought I can do more. And so just you know, looking at, at Joanne and Keith's, this book that's been curated is, there, there is a lot of beauty in this, remarkable bearing witness to the pain of other living things. And I feel uh, quite proud to be able to, to look at the photographs and pay homage. Does that make any sense at all to, to pay tribute that I am thinking of them and putting out good energy? Um, I've talked to Zai about this a little bit before, but you guys were saying very interesting things about having PTSD and, and losing sleep. And, and I know when I first started down the path, you know, with the horses, I was, I thought I can't go down this road like that, you know, because there's, you, you, doing the advocacy is so difficult doing that work. But I always picture their, their spirits, like the spirit, their souls of those animals that after that tragic final blow, ending their lives, here on this earth, I picture this shot of bright light shooting into and returning to the, the cradle of what we are and where we come from. And it might be very trite, and I'm not a particularly religious person, but it was one little thing that I did that helped me kind of get through that, you know, picturing the horse's spirit just blast out of that body and into the cradle of forgiveness and renewal and, and, and that kind of kept me going. So just, and I'll, I'll shut up now, but I just, I, I, I found that helpful to me. And also though, just, you know, to say the incredible work that Jan has been doing with the horseshit campaign. I mean, Jan uh, not only has personally funded and saved many individual lives, but I think it's incredible to know that all of us have to do sometimes just small gestures. We tend to have this idea that everything has to be very big that we do, but sometimes we can just do those small things, whether it is changing our eating habits, whether it is signing on to a website, whether it is sharing a book, whether it is saving one horse's life or one fish's life or even one insect's life, it all makes a difference. So yeah, thank you so much, Jan. And I know that you have a song for us as well. I didn't know what to sing really, um, you know, that would be suitable, but one of my favorite songs is, a, is an old song. It's probably 25 years old. It's called Unloved. And it's more about, you know, uh, well, it's about whatever you want it to be about. I'll just leave it at that. There will be no consolation prize this time the bone is broken clean no baptism no reprise no sweet taste of victory all the stars have fallen from the sky and everything else in between the satellites have closed their eyes the moon has gone to sleep Broken window. 
no rainy night. I am 1962, and I'm ready for a fight. People crying hallelujah while the bullet leaves the gun. People falling, 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 and I don't know where they're falling from. Are they unloved? Unloved. 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 Hoping that the kindness will lead us past the blindness. Not another living soul will ever have to feel unloved, 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 unloved. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah, and you have people in tears backstage, the producers have been sharing that. And you are loved, you know that very much, all of you. Um, I think that this is really a, a powerful way to, to sort of end tonight. But before we do, um, I really hope everybody, uh, and if we can throw to the link right now for everybody to remember to pick up this book. I want to let everybody know because we are living in the age still of the pandemic that of course sometimes with technology there are glitches uh tonight we did experience some of those glitches with our technology but what we're going to do is we're going to reach out to everybody who rsvp'd with the link it will be online you'll be able to share it with your friends and with others jan thank you so much for such a powerful and beautiful performance. Um, Mandy, for our beautiful, wonderful, non-traditional welcome. And I think I speak on behalf of everybody, Joanne and Keith, for putting your heart into this book, for creating, you know, this is like an act of love and an act of courage and a call to action. The book is profound. It is, it does actually deserve the word epic. Um, I want to thank everybody at home for taking the time to join us this evening, for being a part of the launch for this truly historic book, and for all of you giving voice to the voiceless, uh, including Jan giving voice very, very literally to the voiceless, and really revealing the hidden lives of our animal friends. So make sure everybody, if you're listening at home, be sure to pick up a copy of the book. The link is in the chat. The link is scrolling right there. Uh, share it with your friends and with your loved ones. We have to stop things from being hidden. It's time to bring everything out into the light. And with that, my true thanks to all of you for coming to join us tonight. And I wish you all Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you were Thank great. You what a pleasure. Wow. Take Thank care for leading this. And um, we'll be sure to keep this link and, and send it out to as many of your friends as you can. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.